All right, in this video, we are going to talk about reactions from alkynes. A lot of the reactions you're going to see are very similar to the alkene reactions. So let's work through some of these examples. Our first reaction we're going to talk about is hydrogenation. In this reaction, we're going to be reducing an alkyne all the way to an alkene. The reagents you use to do this are H2 and some metal. The most common metals that are used to do this are palladium, platinum, or nickel. So here we have a cyclohexane ring attached with three carbons. Let's label those carbons. One, two, three. And when we uh, run this reaction using H2 and one of these metals, you see we're going to go from an alkyne to an alkene. So we've essentially added four hydrogen atoms. We don't need to draw those hydrogen atoms in, but just to show exactly where they form, two hydrogens are added to carbon one of the alkyne. Another two hydrogens are added to carbon two of our alkyne. So we've now reduced our alkyne straight to an alkane. The second re reduction we want to talk about is going from an alkyne to an alkene. What's important in this reaction is to understand there's two types of alkenes we can make. We can make cis or z alkenes and we can make trans or e alkenes. And the conditions to do these two reactions are different. To form a cis alkene, we're going to be using the reagent H2 and Lindler's catalyst. Lindler's catalyst is a mixture of usually um, lead, calcium carbonate, and quinoline, and that partially reduces the alkyne to our cis alkene. So in this example, we've added two hydrogens that are on the same side are shown here. And again, remember, we don't have to show the hydrogens, but we do have to clearly indicate that our alkene is now cis. The transalkene uses a different set of reagents. You can either use lithium in ammonia or sodium in ammonia. And what this does is this will make our alkyne into a transalkene. So again, we have three carbons, carbon one, two, three, one, two, three, and now we've added two hydrogens. These hydrogens are on opposite sides of each other, and we have our transalkene. All right, let's look at our third reaction. Now we're going to be reacting an alkyne with X2. This is a reaction we've seen with alkenes, and we remember from our mechanism and how the reaction works that we get an anti-addition of our halogens. There are three types of alkynes that we can see, so I'm going to walk through all three examples. We can have a terminal alkyne, where we have an alkyne here. One side is an R group, carbons. The other side is an H. We can have an internal symmetric alkyne, where on either side of the alkane, you have the same groups. So here we have an ethyl group on the left and an ethyl group on the right. Our alkyne is in between two carbon groups, meaning internal, and it is symmetric, meaning both groups attached are the same group. The third type of alkyne we can have is an internal alkyne. Again, where our, uh, our alkyne is connected to carbons on both ends. This example is an asymmetric example where the groups we have on either side of the alkyne, uh, uh, the alkyne are different. Here we have a cyclohexane ring, here we have a methyl. So let's walk through this example. What's going to be important here is understanding how many equivalents we add. All right. <clears throat> so with our first terminal alkyne, we can add one equivalent of Br2. Again, we have to remember we have anti-addition. So to our carbons here, we've added two bromines. These bromines have to be opposite or trans to each other. If we add a second equivalent of Br2, we now add another two bromines across the alkene, giving us a total of four bromines in our example. And remember, in this example here, I've shown the H. You don't have to. Here, I didn't show the H. 
but if you wanted to, you could write and include the H. We probably won't see the reaction written out as separate steps. So if you actually added two equivalents of bromine, it wouldn't be listed separately. You would sort of see an arrow that looks like this all the way here, and you would just see this written as Br2 with two equivalents. So you really, if you encounter this in a problem, you would see Br2 added with one equivalent to get that product, or Br2 with two equivalents, and that will go all the way from our starting alkyne to our halogenated product at the end. So I wrote this stepwise to help explain the reaction, but we will either see that or this as a question on our test. Next, when we look at our internal symmetric alkyne, again, now we're adding two chlorines. And again, in the first example, I included CCL4 as our solvent. Here I didn't. It's okay not to include it. Again, we're going to be adding two chlorines across the alkyne. Right? We've broken one pi bond. So one pi bond is gone. We still get an alkene when we add one equivalent. When we add our second equivalent, we're now doing that reaction across the alkene. So there's only a sigma bond left here. We've now added four chlorines to our product. Again, just like we saw with our first example, it probably would be written this way if you were actually adding two equivalents. It would be written as Cl2 and then parentheses, two equivalents. And then we would go straight from our alkyne all the way to this halogenated product. And our last example is very similar. One equivalent, Br2, two bromines are added across the alkyne. I break one pi bond, leaving me with one pi bond left and then alkene. The second equivalent would react to add two more bromines to our alkyne. Again, usually this would be written here as Br2 with two equivalents. All right, so keep in mind the reactions with the asterisks are what we would really generally see with problems. You wouldn't see something saying the Br as our second equivalent. It would simply say Br2 with two equivalents from our starting alkyne. All right, let's look at our next reaction here. Now we're going to be reacting an alkyne with HX. What we need to remember about this reaction that we learned with alkenes is this will have Markarnikov addition, meaning we will add our halogen to the Markarnikov carbon. And what we're going to see is that's really only relevant when we have a terminal alkyne. So looking at our terminal alkyne example, here are the two carbons of our alkyne. And what we notice is the carbon on the left is connected to one carbon, or this cyclohexane ring, and the alkyne, the carbon on the right, is connected to our H. What that means is we clearly have a Markarnikov position, and that is the carbon of the alkyne on the left side. So when we add HBr in this example, we will be following Markarnikov's rule, adding the H to the side where there's more H's, and the bromine to the side where there's less H's. What that means is we add our bromine to the carbon closest to our cyclohexane, and we add an H to the outside. So I didn't draw in this first hydrogen. Let me draw that in. Again, you don't need to show your hydrogens, but if you wanted to, we now have two hydrogens added here. What's interesting, when we add our second equivalent, again, we do have a Markarnikov position. So this carbon from our alkene is the Markarnikov carbon. So again, when we add HBr, we'll be adding our H to the right side where there's more H's and the bromine to this side where there's less. So the two bromines get added to the same carbon and our H's have been added to the other carbon. Just as we saw with our previous example, it probably wouldn't be written to show one equivalent followed by a second. How this would be written is you would start with your alkyne 
and you would just write HBr as two equivalents. We know that goes through this intermediate, but our final product is this product at the end. Let's look at the example when we have an internal symmetric alkyne, HCl. The internal alkynes are different, and why they're different is there is no Markarnikov position. These carbons here have no hydrogens, they're both connected to carbons, so there is no Markarnikov position. When your alkyne is symmetric, you're going to add an H to one side and a chlorine to the other. But because it's symmetric, it doesn't matter which side you pick. So when you add one equivalent, you'll add an H to one side, a chlorine to the other. Here I chose a chlorine on the left side. I could have easily put the chlorine on the right side. That would give me exactly the same product, just flipped 180 degrees. Now, as we add our second equivalent, we do have a Markarnikov carbon. That is the carbon on the left. This carbon of the alkene has no hydrogens attached to it. The carbon on the right has one hydrogen. So that is our Markarnikov position. So as we use the second equivalent of HCl, again, we're going to add the chlorine to the side, the Markarnikov position, which is in this case the carbon on the left. So that again, the two chlorines are now added to the same carbon and the hydrogens are added to the same carbon as well. And just as we've seen before, it probably would be written as HCl with two equivalents, and that would get us our product shown here. Things become a little more complicated when we have an internal alkyne that is asymmetric. That means that the two groups on either side are not equivalent. In this case, again, we do not have a Markarnikov carbon. These carbons are both equally substituted. So when we add our HBr, because this is asymmetric, we actually form a 50-50 mixture of both products. These are constitutional isomers of each other. So in this case, we would have to draw two products instead of just one, because this is asymmetric. So the first equivalent would form two products. When we continue this reaction, if we added, if we added our second equivalent, now we do have a Markarnikov carbon shown in red, right? The carbon shown in black has added a hydrogen for the top product. For the bottom product, the hydrogen was on the left side and the Markarnikov carbon is on the right. So in this case, we now do have a Markarnikov position and the top product is in red, the bottom product is in red. So our final product will not have four products, we'll only have two. Again, what we notice is the bromines are added to the same carbon here, or they're added to the same product here. So this product would directly get you that product, and, and the bottom product would directly get you that one. All right? And again, this would be written, instead of saying one equivalent followed by the second, it would be written as saying... HBr with two equivalents and then you would have to again now write two products the two bromines can be attached to the carbon on the left the two bromines can be attached to the carbon on the right and you would need to write both products all right let's look at our fifth reaction here this is acid catalyzed hydration all right, and in some respects with alkynes, this is harder to do just using acid. So I really view this as sort of a combination of oxymercuration and acid-catalyzed hydration. The reagents to run this reaction are HgSO4, H2SO4, and water. So you see we're adding acid and water, but mercury helps the reaction to proceed. So what we remember from this reaction is we have Markarnikov addition. So these conditions will add water across our double bond and they will add OH to the Markarnikov position. In our terminal alkyne, there's our Markarnikov position. The carbon on the right has one hydrogen, the carbon on the left has none. So that's clearly our Markarnikov position. 
So if you remember, we're going to break one pi bond at an OH to the Markarnikov side and H to the other side, leaving us with an alkene. All right. In this example, in this product, this is called an enol because it has an alkene and an alcohol. And enols are unstable. They are not the preferred form. So this molecule will undergo a process called tautomerization, which really move, moves the hydrogen and moves the double bond. This is something that cannot be prevented. It automatically happens. So once you form the enol, we don't have to worry about second equivalence in this example. It automatically tautomerizes where the double bond gets moved to the O. So what we see here in this example is we're now forming a ketone. So when we have a terminal alkyne, the final product we'll be get is a ketone. Looking at our next example in internal symmetric alkyne, the same reaction occurs. In this case, there is no Markarnikov or anti-Markarnikov position. We break one pi bond, leaving the other pi bond at an OH to either side. Because it's symmetric, it doesn't matter if you add the OH to the left or the right, you get exactly the same product. Here I've chosen to add it to the left. When you do that, again you get an enol. That enol is unstable. The double bond moves between the carbon and the oxygen. The hydrogen moves to the other side of the double bond, again getting a ketone. So again you see our product here is a ketone in this example. And you could have added the double bond O on the left or the double bond O on the right, those are the identical product. There's only one product. As we saw before, when our alkyne is internal and asymmetric, now we run into an issue. We don't have a Markarnikov carbon, so we're going to add an OH to both sides. When we add that OH to both sides, we get two different products. So we form these two enols, both of these enols can tautomerize. So now in this case, we have to write the two ketones that we can get. I can form my ketone where the C double bond O is on the left carbon, and I also form the ketone where my C double bond O is on the right carbon. So in this internal asymmetric example, we have to draw two products as our major products. All right. So it's important for this reaction to understand this enol is an unstable intermediate. Tautomerization always occurs. Our final products are, in fact, ketones. All right, the next reaction I want to talk about is hydroboration. Again, remember this gives us an anti-Markarnikov addition of an OH. We're going to break a pi bond here, so we have two pi bonds. That leaves us with one pi bond, and we're going to add an OH to the anti-Markarnikov position. So here we've added an OH to the anti-Markarnikov side and H to the other side. Again, if you've noticed, we've formed an enol again. So this reaction will again undergo tautomerization. Because this was a terminal alkyne and we had an H here, we now tautomerize to have our double bond O at the carbon on the right. right. So let me draw in that hydrogen. You don't have to show it, but I will. And now what we see is we form an aldehyde. So when you start with a terminal alkyne, the product you're going to get is an aldehyde because we have anti-Markarnikov addition. All right. Again, when we add the correct reagents to do hydroboration, right, BH3, NOH, H2O2, now when we look at an internal symmetric alkyne, again, with these internal alkynes, there is no Markarnikov position. So what that means is we have to add that OH to both sides, all right? But because it's symmetric, you get the exact same product. So here I'm only showing the OH added to the left, it's also added to the right, but that's the exact same product. Again, what we see here is we have an enol. That enol will tautomerize to form a ketone. So with hydroboration, you're only going to form an aldehyde when you have a terminal alkyne. If you have an internal alkyne, 
there is no anti-Markarnikov position. That double bond O has to form on either one of these carbons. You will get out a ketone. Looking at the internal asymmetric example, again, there's another case. There is no Markarnikov position. We have to add the OH to both sides. In this case, because it is not symmetric, we get two products. We get out our two enols. Both of these will undergo tautomerization. And again, in this case, we will get out two products. So your final reaction will give you two products. Both of these are ketones. All right. So what you should notice from the previous example, when we do the acid catalyzed hydration, you would get out the same products. If you have an internal alkyne, whether you use hydroboration or acid catalyzed hydration, you get out the same product because there is no Markarnikov position. Only when you have a terminal alkyne can you get out an aldehyde with hydroboration. All right, our seventh reaction is in oxidation. So we saw oxidation examples with alkenes. In alkenes, using ozone or KMnO4 gave different products. That's not the case with alkynes. With alkynes, there's no difference between using ozone, and here DMS, or KMnO4. You get exactly the same product. And if you remember from the alkene reaction, we would cleave that double bond, or completely, and in this case, we cleave that triple bond completely. So here I have a cyclohexane with two carbons, my alkyne attached. And in this case, when you have a terminal alkyne, carbon one forms a carboxylic acid, C double bond OH, and carbon two, because there's a hydrogen here, gets completely oxidized to carbon dioxide. So a terminal alkyne will give you a carboxylic acid and CO2. Here is carbon one and there's carbon two. All right, so you have to remember if this is a terminal alkyne, you get out carbon dioxide and a carboxylic acid on the other carbon. When we have internal alkynes, it's much simpler. Again, we will cleave directly through that alkyne and both sides become carboxylic acids. Because it's symmetric, I can just draw this once. I do have two equivalents here. So I cleave this, I form carboxylic acids on both sides, but it's the exact same product. So that's why I indicated a two here. Uh, if you had a problem like this, you would not have to put two, but you would have to recognize you have twice as much of this product as there. You wouldn't necessarily have to write the number two. Again, we get out a carboxylic acid. If we have an internal alkyne that is asymmetric, now we have different groups attached to our alkyne. In this case, we have to write both of those out. Again, we cleave our alkyne. So here we have one, two, three carbons attached to our cyclohexane. There's cyclohexane. Here's carbon one. Carbon one becomes a carboxylic acid. Here's carbon two. Carbon two becomes a carboxylic acid. So there's carbon two and there's carbon three. All right. So again, there's no difference between O3 and KMnO4 when we talk about alkynes. There is a difference when we talk about alkenes. Terminal, we get a carboxylic acid and CO2. If it is internal, we get out carboxylic acids on both sides of our alkyne. Here, because it's symmetric, we only have to write one product. When it's asymmetric, we have to draw both products because both are formed. All right, the last reaction I want to talk about with alkynes is a very, very important reaction. All of the other reactions we've talked about so far this semester are functional group transformations. We're changing from one functional group to another, from an alkyne to an alkyl halide, from an alkyne to a carboxylic acid, from an alkene to an alkyl halide. This reaction is different. Here we are forming a new carbon-carbon bond. And this is going to be important when we talk about synthesis, how we can build up molecules. 
All right, so this is a very important reaction, and the first reaction we're encountering where we form a new carbon-carbon bond. What's important in this reaction, to make this reaction proceed, you have to have a terminal alkyne. So we don't have any examples of internal alkynes. They will not react. What that means is that we have to have a hydrogen attached to our alkyne. And it turns out that this hydrogen, anytime you have a hydrogen attached to an sp hybridized carbon, this hydrogen is acidic. All right. And what that means is if we add a base, we can deprotonate this hydrogen to turn our alkyne into an, what's called an acetylide anion. And that acetylide anion is a very good nucleophile. So if we look at this reaction, it's a two-step process. Step one, we're going to add a base. A base will deprotonate our acidic hydrogen. The bases that are most commonly used are potassium hydroxide or NaNH2. Sodium hydroxide would also work. Then we have step three. In step three, we're going to add some alkyl halide, and that's going to be our carbon source. So if we look at our product in our reaction, let's number our carbons. Here we have our cyclohexane ring, carbon one and carbon two. And then I'm going to put letters on my alkyl halide, A, B, and C. So what I want to point out is carbon B is the carbon attached to my bromine. So just looking at our product, we see what we've done is we've replaced our hydrogen with carbons specifically the carbon that was attached to the bromine. So I'm forming a new bond from carbon 2 to carbon B. So let's label our carbons here, carbon 1, carbon 2, and here we have carbon A, carbon B, and carbon C. So the new bond we've formed is in between carbon 2 and carbon B. So there's our new bond. Carbon 2 is no longer connected to carbon to the H. Carbon B is no longer connected to bromine. 2 is now connected to B. The H is gone and the bromine is gone. And that is the product we get. So in this reaction, we have an alkyne. Our final product has an alkyne. All right but we have now gone from a terminal alkyne into an internal, let's write that up here, to an internal alkyne. All right, so what I'd like to do is just go through this mechanism. Let's see how this reaction actually works. So in step one, let's work with KOH. We're gonna take OH minus, We'll draw the lone pairs on here. That has a negative charge. As I mentioned, this hydrogen is acidic. Now we've added a base. So what happens is our lone pair can deprotonate that hydrogen. These two electrons can move onto our carbon here. So this step is a deprotonation step. Let's draw the intermediate that's formed. Here's our cyclohexane ring. We have our carbon on our triple bond. There's the other carbon. These two electrons have now come, become a lone pair on my carbon atom. This carbon atom right here is nucleophilic. This species, because the carbon has a lone pair and a minus charge, is a very good nucleophile. And that's why in step two, we add an alkyl halide. An alkyl halide is a good electrophile. And that electrophilic position is going to be the carbon that's attached to my bromine. So the second step of the mechanism, my nucleophile is going to react with an electrophile this lone pair is going to form a new bond to the carbon that was attached to the bromine. I'm going to break the carbon-bromine bond. This is an attack step. 
and we've now formed our new product here. And now we've added three carbons to our alkyne. All right, so that's everything I wanted to talk about in the video. The homework assignment you have is to answer these six questions. All I want you to do is draw the product. So here we have different alkynes. One, react that alkyne with Br2, and two, react your alkyne with HCl. Notice how many equivalents you have. Here is one, here is two. Reaction three is the acid catalyzed hydration. Reaction four is hydroboration. So draw the products that are formed here. Reaction five, we're gonna oxidize our alkyne using ozone. And reaction six, we're gonna form a new carbon-carbon bond using a base and an alkyl halide. So please complete these questions and upload them to the course webpage.